Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Art Berman. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with geological consultant at Labyrinth Consulting Services, Art Berman. Art explains why he believes oil is the economy and what the oil market is currently telling us about the U.S. economy. He gives us geological insight on oil markets, explains the importance of oil quality, and why we as traders should be keeping a close eye on open interest. Last but not least, Art discusses why he sees the OPEC Plus production agreement unraveling. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Art. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Art. I'm a petroleum geologist. I've, I've worked in oil and gas for more than 40 years, and uh, most of what I do is still making maps, drilling wells, screening prospects, and uh, my, my public life, if you will, uh, is, is analysis of, of, of the bigger picture and the investment level. And, and of course that, that, that's crucial to my consulting business, but without being grounded on a daily basis in the, in the, the reality of the oil and gas business, uh, I, I, I don't think that I would really be very good to be honest with you. So talk to us a little bit about the people you're consulting. Are they traders, energy companies, who are they? Right. So I consult with, um, with oil and gas companies, uh, who want my expertise and knowledge about, uh, about drilling wells. Uh, I consult with, uh, with, with funds that want to know if a certain company, whether it be energy or otherwise, uh, should or should not be in their portfolio. Uh, I, I work with investors that want to understand where oil and gas prices, uh, supply, demand, fundamentals, non-fundamentals might be leading the market. And of course, I do things like keynote addresses, uh, expert testimony, things like that. We're going to talk obviously a lot about oil and gas markets today and your process for giving your clients information, but I, I want to start off with something that you said to me in a different conversation. And you said, Anthony, you know what? So many people get it wrong when they want to know what's happening with the economy. They look at the money when they should be looking at the energy markets, the oil markets. Explain to everybody why you think they should be looking at oil when it comes to knowing what's happening with the economy. Because oil is the economy. Energy is the economy. Uh, this is, uh, something that I, I realize is, is sort of deeply contrarian, but if you think about it, it's totally logical. My, my first degree was in history and, and so a lot of my orientation is aligned with, well, you know, how did human society and economies evolve and, and, and the, the constant in all of that from hunter gatherers to the present day is that we work and and what is work work is expending calories to produce some outcome 
and 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 we used to uh, pay somebody to do work for us if we had the resources and either didn't feel like doing it ourselves or weren't good at it. And uh, today, uh, most of the work is is done by by oil. Um, and so money is is nothing but a but a call on work. It's a proxy for work. And 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 that has not changed over how many thousands of years of, of recorded history. But somewhere along the line, people decided that the economy runs on money. And and so a lot of very knowledgeable uh, and serious investors and economists particularly uh, somehow lose sight of the underlying component uh, of energy that is so fundamental uh, to all economies. And I mean, I hear people talking about you know equity markets and inflation and central banking, monetary policy, and all sorts of you know modern economic theory. And and I and I hardly ever hear any reference to well, yeah, but but what about the underlying uh, availability and cost of natural resources of which oil is the master resource, at, at least for now. And it has been for at least a century and will be for some time, no matter, you know, how optimistic you are about you know, getting off of oil or, or, or whatever. What is the price of oil telling you right now about the U S economy? Basically, the price of oil right now is is, is about where it should be. Um, both uh, WTI and Brent, and and I can I can explain why I say that. But let's just for now say, uh, you know, that th that's where it should be based on um, just sort of market clearing uh, costs. Uh, frankly, I, I think it's I think the price of oil is, is is too high, not just for the U.S. economy, but the global economy. There, there's not a thing in the world that we're going to do about that. But but I, I, I listen to economists and uh, bankers talk about you know, how frustrating it is that we can't seem to get ourselves as a as a country or as a as a developed world or a world. Uh, to break out of, of this sort of low low economic growth uh, narrative that we've been in certainly since 2007 eight and, and probably before that and and to me it's real obvious why and that is that the that the real cost of producing a barrel of oil I mean I mean real in terms of 2019 dollars is you know roughly double what it was at the beginning of, of, of this century. So if your underlying cost of doing business, and I'm talking about manufacturing, uh, distribution, um, marketing, if it's all dependent on, on, on some cost that has, let's just say, doubled, well, it's really hard to make any money, which doesn't mean that nobody's making any money. But, but you know, taken as a as just a leveling factor across the board, it's just who in the world can can uh, can tolerate a doubling of underlying costs and, and and still make money. I mean that that's that's I'm not saying that's the only problem, but that is a glaring problem that most people seem to not understand or ignore. I mean most people say, oh well, the price of oil is cheap. Right now, I mean, gosh, it was $110 a barrel five years ago, and it went down to 45 or 50, and now it's kind of, you know, in the 60, 70 range. So compared with what it was, it's cheap. Well, okay, fair enough, but uh, investors understand discounting, and if you if you discount all of that, you understand. Well, yeah, I mean, oil at $110 was prohibitive, uh, so the fact that we're down to 70 is better, but it's still not good. Can you talk a little bit more about when you said it's priced right based upon the fundamentals that you are seeing, but you still think it's priced too high? Why? Sure. So when we talk about fundamentals, um, I, I'm, I, I am kind of a, uh, of a technical geek and, 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 and fairly proud of it, but uh, I, I don't get 
too lost in 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 the noise of supply and demand and you know all the kind of stuff that uh, well I read about it all the time I'm interested but uh, I, I use a very simple approach which is called comparative inventory and I just look at at what's in storage whether it be in U.S. crude oil or oil and petroleum products natural gas or OECD or whatever. And and I just compare that level to what it's been over the last five years as a way of telling me that we're either oversupplied, at least compared to the norm, if you will, or undersupplied. And then I cross plot that next to price. And, and I do that because price includes so many human and psychological and market factors that I can't even begin to explain why or how, but it does. And somehow this combination of comparative inventory and price gives me a view of, of where we've been, what trend we're on and where we're likely to go given certain scenarios about mostly inventory that I find to be incredibly enlightening and not particularly shared or known by 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 most people. And so uh, you know, we hear some people that are into oil say, well, it's not about production, it's about exports. Well, okay, that's right, by the way. Um, but it's really about supply. Okay. It's it's not really, you know, it doesn't need to be that detailed or that messy. And and inventories are supply. So what you produce and what you have stored is what you've got. So it's like a checking account and a savings account. Storage is a savings account. If you don't have enough cash to pay a bill and you've got some money in savings, well, you take it out of savings. If you've got more money than you need to pay your bills, you maybe put some of it into savings or an investment or, or something like that. But but the point is, is that there's – you know that that your that your supply of money or oil in this case is not it's not you know it's not in one place and so that kind of cuts through all the complication of production and consumption and exports and demand and you know all these sort of confusing technical things and and so when i do this this kind of comparative inventory approach which by the way i didn't invent and the notion of a 5 year average is hardly uh you know innovative but uh again just for some reason most people just don't do it that tells me i i could i see a trend i see a trend through recent data points when they're cross plotted that way again price versus oil price versus comparative inventory uh i i see where we're where we're going and i also see when we're on excursions above or below that trend line and 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 those excursions are every bit as important as as the points that fall right on the line because that's what price discovery is about and a lot of people look at my 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 plots and they'll say well that's not a very good fit <laughs> i say well yeah that's because human beings are involved with making decisions on on oil price and how much we sell, how much we store, how much we produce. And so the opportunity for investors when when for instance I know as I did in September, October of 2018 that oil prices were way overvalued like by, you know, 15 or 20 dollars. Well, I mean that's a really good time to short oil. Right. <laughs> if you you know, if you're reasonably confident that it should be someplace else, it's probably going to get back there over time because that's what it's always done. Or conversely, toward the end of last year, you know, oil got ridiculously low. It you know, got down to forty five dollars. Well, that's again, fifteen or twenty dollars. I'm talking WTI here uh, too low based on on the trend. And lo and behold, it came back. And right now it's right back on that trend line. So if you know how this works, and, and I'm not saying that it's foolproof because because nothing is, there's huge uncertainty in everything that we invest in. But if, if you're pretty sure that we're on an excursion, well, heck, that, that's a great opportunity.
So, so that that that's that's how I know that 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 if we're you know if those two factors, comparative inventory and price, are lining up according to the trend they've been on for a while, then oil is priced about right. If we're above it, above the line, it's too high. If we're below it, you know, we're, we're too low. Um, but but the bigger problem is is back to your first question, and that is well. What's the right price for the world economy to to function well and to prosper? And 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 we left those days behind a long time ago. We left the days of cheap oil, truly cheap oil, uh, twenty, thirty, forty dollars in in today's money, uh, back in the nineteen seventies as a world. And 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 basically, the world has been using debt to buy forward. What they can't, what we can't provide ourselves in terms of cheap energy ever since, and and so uh, that's not a it's not a criticism. Um, that's uh, and and there isn't a solution. It's it's just the way it is. Because you believe that people should be looking at oil when it comes to knowing what's happening with the U.S. economy. What happens if the price of oil goes up dramatically or down dramatically? What would that tell you about the U.S. economy? If the price of oil goes up or down dramatically in a, at least a semi-permanent way, and, and by the way, this happens and happened as recently as mid-2017, oil got devalued about 20% worldwide and has stayed on that trend, uh, lower oil prices are better for the economy. That just means that the cost of making things and doing business just went down by however, um, wh whatever that amount was. So the reasons why it went down are another conversation. But on a, on a, a very high level, Lower prices are good and higher prices are bad. If prices go up, then the inverse is true. It just means that it's harder uh, to, uh, to, to, to make things, uh, to sell things, and to transport and distribute things. And of course, there's a, there is a, a, a direct linkage between oil price and, and, and economic things like interest rates, money supply, et cetera. And so when oil prices go up, uh, the, first, the first part of the economy that's, that's hit really hard are the developing countries, uh, way before it's a problem for those of us in, in the developed world, because those countries are uh, more, uh, their, their economies are, are much more dependent on oil solely and oil uh, you know, as a as a liquid fuel, uh, whereas in the developed world we have the luxury of of electricity at least for a lot of our needs. We don't use oil to make electricity for the most part. We use natural gas and coal, so the effects are lagged. They they hit us just the same. But usually, when the price of oil goes up, inflation goes up, interest rates go up, and that that hammers the developing economies, which ultimately is bad for us in the United States because those are big time consumers. It's also bad for us because an awful lot of the refined products, the gasoline, the diesel that we export goes to in, in, you know, in this hemisphere, most of it goes to South America. So if, if those countries and their populations uh, have their buying power diminished, then it hurts not only sales of things like petroleum products, but I mean, that's a huge piece of our uh, account balance, huge. And, and, and one of the things that I, uh, I, I thoroughly agree with, and I don't agree with much um, when it comes to the so-called shale revolution, but one of the things that, you know, you, you got to be a fool not to agree with is that we we import a heck of a lot more oil today than we did 10 years ago, and that's really good for our economy, not to mention the jobs that are created here by producing and, and doing all those things. But uh, so, again, it's, it's just 
it's just so hard for me to say, oh, well, let's talk about oil as if it's a, you know, some kind of a secular parochial subject, which is somehow different from the economy. You know, let's let let's let's stop talking about uh, uh, about football and let's talk about politics. Okay, I mean, you know, people make make that shift seamlessly. What I'm saying is, uh, you know, we we can do that. I mean, you know, my wife and you know, our dinner guests probably don't want to talk about comparative inventory, <laughs> but <laughs> but they and, and I respect that, and I'm I'm going to shut up about it when I'm in public, but. Uh, you, you just can't you can't compartmentalize energy and say, oh, that's a separate topic that's unrelated to all the rest. It's interesting hearing you say that if the price of oil goes down, that it would be better for the economy. And if it goes up, it's going to be worse for the economy. Not interesting in the fact that that's what you believe. What's interesting to me as a trader is to see how the market will react because you never know. Right. I mean, if, if oil goes down dramatically or up dramatically, I'm curious to see how the market takes things. Now, do you exclusively look for things in your research when you're going to talk to clients that you believe will have a market impact? Or do you not even think about that and just report everything you're seeing on the geological front and then let the clients decide? Oh, that's a... Fascinating question, Anthony, and uh, thank you for asking it. First of all, um, I like to think that everything I do is about the bigger picture. Uh, th there are so many details of, uh, of oil and gas exploration and production that – uh, it, it's it's very difficult to have a conversation about those things with people that don't have a similar technical background in uh, geology, engineering, geophysics or something because they're just so hugely technical. So the simple answer is no. <laughs> in the same way I don't talk about comparative <laughs> inventory at dinner parties, uh, you know, I'm not going to put out – stuff uh, to my clients about, you know, all the details of, of why, you know, why Bakken oil is, is slightly better than Permian oil for its middle distillate content and therefore you're not as hard pressed to make diesel out of it, which is ultimately important for, you know, for refiners because, you know, who cares about that? But, um, and, and I, I also like to think that, that a lot of my my activity, a lot of what I do every day, isn't geological at all. I mean, the geology is playing in the background all the time. But I mean, I I look at at forward curves. I look at price. I look at, you know, are are we are we long? Are we short? Uh, you know, what's the trade weighted value of the U.S. dollar? I mean, these are just things that I you know, what's the what's the CPI, the Consumer Price Index this month? I mean, I you know, these are this is just part of a big part of my day it has zero to do certainly with rocks and only in a derivative way to do with oil. I'm, you know, I'm making a, you know, a graph of, you know, of, of, of uh, spot Brent forward curves. Well, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm graphing something that's crude oil, but that's not what anybody's thinking about. We're talking about price. We're talking about, you know, about, about hedging and swaps and, you know, all the things that, that, that people look at forward curves to do. So I definitely filter uh, what, I, what I put out there because it's not – I mean it may all be important to me in terms of you know, how my, my, my weird brain works and analyzes information. But you know, people are only interested in, in a couple of key bullet points that affect their bottom line. And I, I appreciate that because I'm the same way. I don't want to hear all this painful detail. I just want you to tell me, you know, answer my question. Yep. <laughs> and if I want more information, I'll ask for it. And if you're going too far, say, whoa, you lost me, you know, three paragraphs ago. <laughs> you know, let's let's restart this conversation. And 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 the same, I mean, you see uh, the things I put out there on Twitter. Well, I mean, some of what I put out there, it's just, okay, I'm I'm making this graph now and it you know, it's kind of interesting to me, and there's probably five people out there that will find it interesting, and the other 
you know, 50,000 or so that look at what I do every day, I'll probably say, what, what's he doing? Yeah, you know, this is bogus. <laughs> but, but, but I don't put it out there for everybody. I mean, I've got people that I, you know, that, that that's a way that I communicate with. And usually I'll get a rise out of one of those guys, whether it be, you know, he'll respond to my tweet or he'll send me a direct message or something. Cause I mean, that, you know, that's my community. Those are the guys that I learn from. And by the way, very few of them are geologists. I mean, most of those guys are chemical engineers and refiners or traders or investment bankers. I mean, that that's that that's the only way that I can be better is 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 learning their perspective. Yeah, to me, this is your edge as a consultant. You have an expertise of evaluating the overall oil and energy market. You're not just coming to them with geological stories that you see happening. You're able to look at the big picture and say, hey, look, this is important. <laughs> this is something you should take a look at because this could have an impact on price. And I want to go through a recent scenario where you noticed something happening on the geological front and also looking at other things that you mentioned this is important. And you went and told your clients about it. So could you walk us through one of those? Sure. The, the, the simplest one and, and, and kind of the most recurring um, nightmare, if you will, is the issue of oil quality. And, and so most people, they say, oh, wow, you know, the United States is producing you know, 11 point something million barrels a day. And isn't that great? And we're the biggest oil producer in the world. And, you know, we've, we've really, we've shown those guys, you know, <laughs> those Saudis, you know, they thought they could beat us. Isn't, isn't that great? And, and, and okay, you know, maybe it is, but I look at, well, what is, what, what kind of oil are we producing and, and how useful is it? And, you know, and I, I, I alluded to this in an anecdote a, a few minutes ago, but most of the oil that we produce in the United States and certainly the oil that comes from these so-called shale or tight oil plays is, is super, super light. OK, so it's almost gasoline. <laughs> it's, really? you know, in its native state. Yeah. And and, you know, that worked really great for the United States in the 1930s and the 1940s and, you know, even even longer because what did we use oil for? You know, mostly for gasoline. I mean, there are other things too, plastics, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, the, the, the biggest single use of oil was gasoline. Well, as the world evolved, uh, other, other fuels became more important. And today, diesel or distillate is not only the number one transport fuel, but it's also the cash cow of of US petroleum exports. Well, you can't use ultra light oil whether it's from the Permian Basin or the Eagleford Shale or the Bakken or whether it's from a conventional source. You can't make diesel out of ultra light oil. You just can't do it. Well, that's kind of important. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I I read all these these, you know, these documents by the International Energy Agency or, you know, you name it, uh, you know, different investment banks about, oh, well, you know, the United States is producing so much oil, it's gonna have this effect on global supply and it's gonna cause the price to go down. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not if you can't use it. And so, you know, let's let's th think about what's happening right now. Indulge me for a moment. Um, the physical markets in oil and gas right now are super tight for heavy oil, not in general. So when, you know, when the Saudi oil minister says, well, gee, I just don't see it. I, I don't see that we need to increase production because of Iran sanctions. I mean, he's telling the truth. That is true in general. You know, if you take all oil, all liquids, you know, we've, we've, the world is well supplied. But the problem is, is that the only way you can, you can make anything out of this ultra light oil is by mixing it with heavy oil that contains the, the, the components that you need to make diesel. And so right now we're in a situation where Venezuela is going down the drain they're a big producer of heavy oil. We've had all sorts of problems getting oil out of Canada for a variety of reasons that I won't bore your listeners with right now. That's heavy oil. 
and Mexico's production is declining, and that's heavy oil. So right, and and by the way, Iran <laughs> produces heavy oil on top of a lot of lighter oil and, and and natural gas liquids. But so right now, the world is in a huge dilemma, in that we've got to have. A certain amount of heavy oil to blend with the light oil, or we can't make the products that make us money. And so, when you hear people talk about, you know, the how tight the market is, that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about the general supply of oil. So, you know, uh, again, is it is it a fine point? I don't think so. I think it's a crucial point that that not all oil is the same, and and you can't make an economic product. If you think about it that way, so you've got to be a little bit more specific. And again, I, I, I would not ask my clients um, or or people listening to this podcast uh, to understand, you know, what the difference between, you know, twenty API gravity sour oil and forty five API gravity sweet oil is. They don't care. It doesn't matter. What's important is they know there's a difference. And we've got too much or too little of one or the other, and and so I, you know, the the, the chest beating aspect of of American exceptionalism it doesn't really impress me all that much, unless our oil is of the same quality and usefulness as let's just say Saudi oil or Russian oil. And the simple answer is it isn't. Besides API and EIA, what data point should oil traders be watching on a regular basis? For right now, this probably sounds weird coming from a geologist, but I think you should be looking at open interest. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. Because this oil rally, if you want to call it that, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of on life support right now because of the you know this artificial Iran crisis, and I—I I, I don't mean to, you know, to diminish its significance, but it's—it's it's artificially created. Let's just put it that way. Uh, you know, we've had a an oil price rally that began pretty much at the end of last year, and you know, prices have climbed from forty-five to seventy dollars WTI, and you know, fifty to seventy-five on Brent, and yet y you look at at the at the commitment of traders, and I mean, this is a rally with almost zero open interest. And so, w what's that telling us? Well, I mean, the simple answer is, first of all, I don't know. I mean, I can speculate, of course, but uh, so so what's going on? So the uh, the you know the big money that's involved in in futures trading is staying back. They're staying on the sidelines, and they're saying, well, yeah, we see what you're seeing, but uh. -uh. We're not going there. I mean, so the the you know the the level of open interest uh, for 2019, depending on which product you want to talk about, but you know for something like you know like like diesel, for instance. I mean, my goodness, it's you know it's like 20 percent of what the average open interest was in 2018. I mean, holy cow! I mean, what is going on here? Uh, and yet the price of oil keeps going up, or you know the rally has sustained itself. How is that even possible? So that that that's a, that's a data point that that I I think that you know that anyone who accepts the 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 thesis that began this conversation, which is that oil is the economy, ought to pay attention to. Whether you're investing in oil or or energy, it doesn't matter. But the fact that there's so little apparent interest in in putting money by you know by 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 big funds into oil right now uh, that I think that has some profound potential implications for how you make the rest of your investments earlier you mentioned that based off of the fundamentals that you are seeing that the oil market is priced correctly right now what is the number one thing that you see in the energy markets that is priced wrong right now? Yeah, that's 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 a 
a fascinating question again, Anthony. Um, well, I mean, okay, so from a philosophical standpoint, nothing's ever priced wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> markets said. markets are are, are ruthless, and uh, uh, you know, if, if, if I mean, a, a market is always short. On, on 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 whatever, and if a market get away with 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 paying less, then it will. So by definition, that's the right price. Uh, but but yeah. So right now, the 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 two things that 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 I look at that I think are are interestingly perhaps mispriced or or, or misvalued are, are diesel and gasoline, and and we've seen. Uh, you know, gasoline demand has has been much much higher recently than it it has been for quite a while, and some for some reason diesel, which is you know the 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 more uh, the the more in demand product, ha- has been very low, and and we're we're half a year away from the implementation of these new marine uh, low sulfur requirements called IMO 2020. And what do all the ships in the world run on? Well, they run basically on diesel, on some kind of you know, fuel oil. And and so, why is it exactly that uh, you know that less than half, than just more than half a year away from completely changing our our, our fuel standards for a huge, huge component of the global economy, which is shipping, um, our markets. Not very concerned, apparently, about uh, where that diesel is going to come from. Um, I, again, I'm not saying that the price is wrong. I'm just surprised that 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 it isn't higher, um, at least in preparation for all of that that happening. So, uh, again, the market's not wrong, but I, you know, I wonder if the market doesn't have uh, some false sense of confidence in the industry, the refining industry's ability uh, to, to make that transition and provide it at a, at a price that, that, that works. So that, that, that's a concern I have. The other, the other thing I, I, I look at, though, is just the price of oil in general, that if you, if, if you, if you read the, the headlines or listen to any kind of analysts, uh, it, it's all bullish. Um, that you know, if, if prices are lower, well, they're going higher because you know we just don't have enough of this, that, or the other. And 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 I, I certainly understand that that argument and and agree with it to some extent. Obviously, I I told you I think the price of oil is about right. So you know, <laughs> I'm not calling for you know for I'm not saying it's too high, but but I I think what we've learned over the last five years is that. Um, there seem to be some, you know, some real boundary conditions on on the price of crude oil, and and whenever I hear smart people, uh, you know, get on Bloomberg or whatever and, and say, well, we're going to be at ninety dollar Brent or hundred dollar Brent by the end of the year, uh, you know, I, I shake my head and say, really, guy, <laughs> you know, how exactly does that work? Um, because it, that means, yeah, you, you can you can get there, but again, going back to comparative inventory, I'll tell you how much inventory you got to run through to get to ninety dollar or hundred dollar oil, and I, I mean for more than a week or two. I mean some sort of sustainable level, and we haven't been at that storage level uh, any time in the last five or six or seven years. So we're talking about getting to a level of, of of exhausting storage that is historically anomalous. I'm not saying we can't get there. I'm just saying, do, do you do you hear what you're saying? I mean, what you're saying sounds great, but it just is inconsistent with with you know the mechanics of how this this machine works, unless something really radical happens. So those those are just sort of a couple of examples. Last question before we get into rapid fire. What is the biggest story that oil or gas traders should be watching the second half of this year? I, I, I don't know that there's a, a single story, but but what I'll what I'll say is that I, I, I think that 
that we're going to see um, a uh, an unraveling of of this OPEC plus uh, production agreement. Uh, we seem to have made it through the the, the weekend without anything particularly uh, radical happening at the this this OPEC meeting that that uh, just concluded in in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, but. Um, What's what's really going on is, is that some of the key players, including Russia, and, and and there are many other important players that are less significant. They they really you know they really want to just let's just make some money here, guys. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we we get the fact that you know we've got to cut production to keep the price up, but we we just need to make some money, and and so. Uh, what what I, what I I look back at the fourth quarter of 2018, and uh, and I I mentioned you know this uh, you know we, we went through a big price collapse that everybody just sort of says oh well that's over and we don't care about that anymore but but the the unavoidable truth is that the global oversupply of oil in the fourth quarter of 2018 was the biggest since the 1980s. I mean, you know, bigger than in any quarter by far during the oil price collapse 2014, 15, 16, and part of 17. I mean, you know, did you hear what I just said? <laughs> the world has this appetite for producing its ass off as soon as prices get to some level where people think they can make money. And we just saw it. And, and and the results were kind of catastrophic in a way. And so what, what I think is is something that, that traders and oil traders particularly, but traders in general ought to be thinking about is if you know if 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 we get back into that into that mode in the second half of the year, um, there are gonna be some structural dynamics going on that are going to throw all these markets into some kind of volatility chaos that I, I can't even predict where it's going to go. But, but you know, uh, oil producers are, are, are like, you know, the guys that I hung out with in the junior high locker room. And, uh, you know, you, 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 know, you give them something that they want and they're going to go berserk over it. And, and, and that's the way producers are. And, 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 and the, the market, the, the analysts, they, they, they seem to pay way too much attention to demand and not nearly enough to producer behavior and the effects on supply. Now, I'm not saying demand isn't important, but, you know, pick up any any analysis of oil right now, and I'll bet you most of it is talking about, oh, well, you know, demand is lower, it's weaker, and the global economy is looking kind of weird. And, and, and you know, but, but what about the possibility that we're going to go right back to a situation like we just finished in the end of 2018, where the boys in the junior high locker room go crazy and, and produce way too much oil? Um, that, that, that's what I would that's what I would pay attention to. And, and by the way, as, as all that was, was building, there were very few people that were paying attention to the fact that, hey, look what's happening. Look where we're going. Everybody was in this narrative, oh, well, we don't have enough oil, which was true in you know, August, September of last year. And so many people just you know, didn't pay attention to this build that was going on. Uh, smart people too. So I don't say that out of disrespect. It's just easy to take your eye off the ball because the ball moves really fast. Yes, it does. Fantastic insight, Art. But we're not done yet. I have some rapid fire questions next if you're ready for those. I'm ready. <laughs> All right, everyone. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Art, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Fascinating question, Anthony. Uh, I, I'm a geologist. I worked for a big oil company for 
half my career, I didn't even know what oil trading was 20 years ago. And, and, and as recently as five years ago, uh, I, I didn't understand the mechanics. So uh, I, I'm not going to tell you the name of, of, of anyone, but once I got connected to people that actively traded, uh, and, and, I, you know, and I see an awful lot of them on Twitter, that, that absolutely changed the way I thought about my, my whole profession. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome being a geologist? The hardest thing for me to overcome was that it's really not about rocks and it's not about oil. It's about money and the economy. And I know I said that the economy is oil, but it's really about making money. How has your process covering the energy markets evolved over the years? I spend a whole lot more time, like probably 80% of my time analyzing information that doesn't have a thing in the world to do, strictly speaking, with geology, futures curves, uh, interest rates, uh, uh, you know, trade weighted dollar. I mean, that I mean, I just never even would have imagined I, I didn't care about any of that stuff. But I've learned that I, I, I can't do what I do without knowing all that stuff. That's new. What is one attribute that you believe every geologist should have? An understanding of, of the global picture of how their product, if it's oil, if it's gold, if it's platinum, whatever it is, how does that fit in to, to, to the way that the world thinks about and uses whatever it is they provide? Favorite book about energy markets? Favorite book about energy markets? I'm a huge fan of Václav Schmiel. Um, energy transitions, um, all, all of his books about, uh, you know, what are the main, uh, the, the main dis breakthroughs that, that have resulted in, in the energy we have today. Favorite movie about trading? Big short. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? To pay more attention to the people that, that, that participate actively in the global marketplace. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge as a geological consultant, what would you say? That I don't consult on geology. I consult on, on economic trends that are founded and motivated by, 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 the, by geology and oil. Last question for today, Art. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? I like to read. I like to run. I like to be with my family. Where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? Uh, at at AE Berman 12 is, is my Twitter handle. My website is my name, artberman.com. Uh, between the two of those, um, you'll probably know more about what I'm thinking today than, than you ever wanted to. <laughs> All right. I love this. I learned so much from you today. I learned so much from you on Twitter and a shout out to my friend, Eric macro voices podcast. That's where I found you excellent resource for information. You're on there regularly and I highly recommend everyone goes there and checks it out. Art, thank you so much for coming on futures radio show. Thanks for having me, Anthony. It's been fun. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.